All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, that's very bright. The uh, mood lighting is perfect. All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to the City Gates Church. Uh, and welcome to uh, those of you who are new with us this morning uh, or are visiting the church, if that's you. Uh, we'd love to connect with you after the service ends at the welcome table, which you pass as you were entering into the sanctuary. Uh, there will be people there who would love to uh, meet with you, answer any questions that you might have, and help get you pointed in the right direction. All right, I've got three announcements for you this morning before we get into, our, into the service. Um, first off, for the men of the congregation, this coming Saturday, so that's April, uh, April 13th, Saturday, the men's ministry is doing a, uh, they're, they're going to be at Burke Lake Park, um, and, uh, and they're going to be doing an outdoor hike there. Which I just realized is actually redundant. I think all hikes are by definition outdoors. So they're going to be doing a hike at, uh, at Burke Lake Park. Uh, the hike is a couple of miles long, uh, and it's open to the men in the congregation, as well as any of your children who are able to hike uh, the distance. I think it's about five mile long loop or so. Um, so again, it's open to, to the men in the congregation as well as children who are able to hike along that path. Uh, the registration page is up. There's more information on there if you are interested. Uh, so please check that out if you'd like more information or to participate in the event. All right, so that's the men's ministry. Uh, moving along, some of you may not know this, but City Gates Church has a softball team called the Crashers and they are gearing up for this upcoming season. Uh, they are also the league champions from last year, uh, which, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Very cool. Um, so if you're interested in that and, uh, and you'd like to participate in this upcoming softball season, uh, then you can stop by the welcome table after the service. Uh, there'll be one or two members from the team there who are available to answer questions as well as get your contact info if you'd like to uh, be part of that roster. There's also more information in the e-bulletin, uh, as, as, and if you prefer to just reach out via email, there are emails listed there as well. So check that out if you'd like to learn more about the crashers. All right. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to something new that we're trying called the City Gates Church Monthly Newsletter, which looks like so. Um, it's a short one-pager of uh, what we think is useful information uh, about the things that are taking place during the month here at the church. So our, our, our intent, we're going to try it out, we'll see how it works. Our intent is to have it at the beginning of each month available at the welcome table for you to pick up um, so that you can be able to scan it quickly and see what's happening here at the church over the course of the next four weeks. Um, so again, it's available at the at the welcome table. If you've, uh, if you've got any suggestions or if there's any input that you have upon reviewing it, then please feel free to let us know. We're always uh, interested and in thinking about ways to provide as much information as we possibly can through to the congregation in as many formats as we can. So that, that's available at the welcome table. All right. Well, at this point, we're going to transition to our time of prayer. Our prayer mandate this week concerns loneliness. And so we'll be praying along those lines in just a minute. For our internal ministries, we'll pray for the multimedia and the web teams here at the church. And then for our external missionaries, we'll pray for Joel and Deborah Tiefel. Up until fairly recently, they had been serving as missionaries in West Africa. But they've unfortunately had to come off of the mission field due to uh, significant health complications for Deborah. It's been spanning for uh, a significant period of time. Um, so we'll be praying for them as well as for this unexpected transition that they are experiencing. So with that, would you please join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the privilege of gathering together to worship you. And Father, as we gather together, we think of and we lift up those who struggle with loneliness right now, right here in our church. We pray that they would experience your comfort. We pray that they would find their ultimate fulfillment in you. And really, we pray that that would be uh, uh, the, the desire, the calling for all of us, that all of us would find our ultimate fulfillment, our ultimate purpose in you and in the, the desires and designs that you have for us. As they seek after you, Father, we pray that they would find fulfillment in loving you and, and those whom you have placed around them. And may you also enable us as the body of Christ to provide the love and the support and the encouragement that you desire and that is pleasing to you. And as we consider our internal ministries, those that, are, that take place within our church, we thank you for those who serve on the multimedia and the web teams. We thank you for the skill, the diligence that you've given them, the creativity that you've endowed them with, and we pray that you would bless their efforts. We pray that you would enable them to continue to be a blessing to this church. 
Lastly, we pray for Do uh, Joel and Deborah Teeple, especially during this time of transition. We, we pray uh, first and foremost for healing for, for Deborah and ask that you would give her doctors and the, the medical staff that she works with great wisdom and insight as they seek to treat her. We pray that through those means that you would provide healing to her. And we pray that you would show yourself as their provider and their comforter and ask that they would experience, even in this challenging time, that they would experience your abundant blessing. So we commit all of this to you, and we ask for your blessing upon our service as we seek to gather and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Tripp. Good morning, church. Let's stand together and sing.
Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness you rose again victorious faithfulness none can deny through the storm and through the fire there is truth that sets me
heights the higher no way what a glorious dawn fear of death is gone for we carry his life in our beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You left the heavens and your glory, your life a sacrifice laid down. Sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. 
praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus and you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning to praise the name of Jesus. Together as brothers and sisters, as a body of people who have put our faith in you, we call upon the name of Jesus as our Savior, as our Redeemer, as our hope in this world, as our friend. And we just, we don't even know what to say sometimes, but just to say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son into this world to come and meet us where we are in our lostness, in our sinfulness. In our confusion, we just had walked away. We've walked away from you. And you sent your son, the visible image of the invisible God, to come down and save us and to love us. You put on flesh and you put your arm around us. You put your hands on us. You loved us and you showed us a better way. You showed us the right way. You showed us truth. And you showed us a way, Jesus showed us the way to the Father and that led him directly to the cross. And so, Lord, in the cross we know that, that the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus has restored our relationship with you, that intimacy of a relationship with you where we have face-to-face -face again, the way that you desired it, the way that you created it to be. We're so thankful for that, and not only the cross, but the risen and resurrected Jesus who conquers sin and doesn't leave us dead in our transgressions. We're just so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful just for the name of Jesus. So it's in his name, in the matchless name, the wonderful name, the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus that we pray this morning. We love you. Amen.
Well, welcome this morning. If you have your Bibles, please go ahead and open them up to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And while you're doing that, I'd like to ask the Doty family if they'd like to come forward. We get to have a baby dedication this morning. Awesome. So we've got Nathan and Amber coming up with little Caleb and his sister and brother, Lily and Luke. Baby dedication is often seen as something for children because we call it a baby dedication, right? But in a sense, what it also is, is a commissioning for parents. Uh, There's a common theme that we see throughout Scripture that parents, especially fathers, pass instruction on to their kids. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Pastor Tripp did a great job teaching us from Proverbs, and all of that instruction we saw was anchored in the fact that it was a father that was trying to instruct his children. And every time we do a baby dedication, we give out one of these plaques with the verse from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 that says, you, and this is addressed to the parents, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you shall be in your hearts, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So again, just another example in Scripture of what we want to see in the kids has to first be in the parents. And so we'll read here from um, another passage that makes the point If you're there in 2 Timothy, and you can quickly get over to Psalm 78, you can just keep a finger there. But Psalm 78, um, starting in verse 1, I'll read the first seven verses. It says, Give ear, O people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known. Check this. And our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children telling them to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. And I think you guys have wonderful works to tell these kids about that you have seen the Lord do. Four, it says, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children that the generation to come might know them the children who would be born, that they would arise and declare them to their children. So you need to know it. Pass it on to Luke and Lily and Caleb so that they can then pass it on to their children that they might arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So again, just the big point that I want to drive home is that we call it a baby dedication, but it's really like a commissioning for mom and dad. One of the things that I say frequently about marriage is the best thing that you can do for your relationship as husband and wife is to individually fall deeper in love with the Lord because that's either going to make you more of the person that God wants you to be and therefore you become more lovable to the other person and that enhances your relationship or you become more peaceful and, and patient and enduring with the other person and that's good, right? So the best thing you can do for your marriage is to individually love, each, is, is to individually love the Lord but the best thing you can do for your kids is to individually love the Lord because then he's going to use you to teach them the things that he wants these kids to know and he's going to give you the strength and the patience that you need to endure with all the challenges. You're like, God, I'm trying to raise these kids for you. And he meets you in that and gives you the strength and the ability that you need. So we're going to pray for that right now. Would you, would you join us? We're going to pray that um, we would thank God for Caleb and for bringing him into Nathan and Amber's life. And we're going to ask that God would give Nathan and Amber the strength that they need as they make themselves available to be a source of blessing to little Caleb. Would you join me as we pray now? Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks for this life that you have created, Lord. We give you thanks for Caleb. Lord, we give you thanks for ten little fingers and ten little toes, for two little eyes and one little nose. We give you thanks, God, for the fact that he is formed in your image, that he has inherent dignity and worth because he's made in the image of a God who loves him. And we pray, Lord, that you would soon stir in him an awareness of that identity. Lord, that he would know that there's a God who made him and that there's a God who loves him and that he would come to that knowledge through the father and the mother that you have given to him. God, we pray that you would help Nathan and Amber to show your love to Caleb. 
Father, that they would know that love personally and then reflect that love to Caleb. That you would give them the patience that they need, give them the wisdom that they need, give them the endurance that they need. And Father, we pray, Lord, for Luke and Lily as well, that they would be a source of blessing to their brother and that he would be a source of blessing to them. Father, we see that these children are the next generation, not only of the church, but of the world. And so we pray that you would use them to bring blessing into the world. Lord, may they participate in your plan for the kingdom. May you use Nathan and Amber to prepare them for that. Help Nathan and Amber to see the abilities that you've placed into Caleb and into Luke and Lily as well. And help them to cultivate and develop those abilities and those interests that they might be able to surrender these children up unto you for your use and your purposes. God, I pray that you draw Nathan and Amber closer together to you personally, that nothing would come between them, Lord, that they would be a united front and that they would fall more deeply in love with each other as they partner in raising these kids. We ask for all these blessings now, grateful for all the blessings you've already provided. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. There you go. Hey. All right, so if you have your Bibles now, please go ahead and turn them to uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2. We took a couple weeks off as we were looking at Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. And now we're back in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a pastor that he has been mentoring. Timothy is leading a church in the city of Ephesus, which is a rough town. The place is swarming with idols and idolatry. Those of you who know a little bit about the ancient world may remember that there were seven wonders of the ancient world. And of those seven wonders, one of them was located in Ephesus. It was the temple of Artemis. That was her Greek name, or the temple of Diana. That was her Roman name. And again, it was located in Ephesus. There were seven wonders of the ancient world. One of them's in Ephesus, and it's a temple to this pagan god. That's what the city where Timothy is ministering is famous for. So you can imagine that as a Christian, much less as a Christian pastor, it is a somewhat difficult place to live and lead. We also learn in the book of Acts that Christians there had been the target of a riot because they were suggesting that people shouldn't worship at the city's big, famous temple. It's a difficult place to be. It's a difficult place to live. And I want you, please, to think about that for a moment. That Ephesus was a hard place to live and to lead as a Christian. That the culture there was definitely against Timothy. It was moving in another direction from the things that he believed and that he was teaching. And I want you to know that because I also want you to see that what Paul's going to tell him is, yeah, I, I know it's difficult. I know it feels like everyone's against you. I know it feels like you're bringing a message that is not being immediately well received. I know that it's a hard place to live and to lead. But go ahead and sort it all out. That's Paul's message to Timothy. I know it's hard. Figure it out. Church, Paul doesn't say, go ahead and, and, and just kind of bug out. I know it's hard. I don't know what I was thinking. I know there are some other places. You could live a little bit better of a life. It might be a little easier for you. You know, maybe move to a red state if you can. That's not what Paul does. Paul gives this young man a gospel-centered pep talk and says, Hey, Timothy, keep going. The point is, yes, it is a tough climate. But church, hear me on this. Paul believes that Timothy can overcome all of these obstacles in Christ. Paul believes that Timothy can overcome all of these obstacles in Christ. Read with me here, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. 
Paul writes, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And these things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing you might want to jot down is the fact that life is hard. Again, life is hard. And the first thing I want to point out is that Paul had no illusions. He understood that life is hard. There is opposition. There are setbacks. There is a lot of work to do. But his message is, don't think that's odd. Don't think that's strange. And friends, I would tell you this morning the same thing. That just because it's hard doesn't mean what you're doing is wrong. Those of you caring for small children, it's hard at times. Those of you caring for aging parents, it's hard at times. Those of you trying to be faithful at work, it's hard at times. And then your boss and your coworkers, or just business and economic conditions can make it even harder. The people in your dance studio or on your team may be hard to deal with at times. Your teachers and your classmates, or to spin it around, your students may be hard to deal with at times. Church, your marriage might need to be pushed uphill for a while before it coasts down the other side. Friends, just because things are hard doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Life is hard. And Paul makes that point using three examples, which means... That you should think of yourself this way. Paul uses these examples because this is how he wants you to think of yourself as a Christian. He sets forward the example of a warrior, the example of an athlete, and the example of a farmer. Now, I don't know which one appeals most to you, or, or maybe you like them all, but we'll work our way down the list, and we'll see what any of them have to do with us. First is the soldier. You remember that the Roman Empire is in the background of everything that is happening in the New Testament. So Paul is thinking of a Roman legionnaire. These were all unmarried men. And the empire stretched from England in the northwest down through Spain and into North Africa, then reaching east as far as modern-day Saudi Arabia and Iraq. If you overlaid a map of the United States, you'd see that the size of the Roman Empire at its peak in the first century was roughly the size of the United States with a big swimming pool in the middle called the Mediterranean Sea and then a kind of little hot tub over on the side known as the Black Sea. But all of that space then would be about the size of the Roman Empire. And a legionnaire could be assigned anywhere across the empire in much the same way as those of you who work for the State Department or the military or other government agencies can be assigned all around the world. Sometimes you're happy about it, and sometimes you're not. But you go where you're sent, and you do what you're told, because that's the oath you took. That's the promise that you made. For Roman soldiers, if you could reach 20 years of service, then you could retire. Again, not unlike what we're familiar with. And then you could get married. Maybe settle down and figure out what to do with that pension. But not until your service was up. 
Roman soldiers and government servants today, especially members of the American military, accept the fact that life will be different. There are things that you are not going to have that other people will. You accept the fact that you are not going to put down deep roots. You accept a life that involves sacrifice and suffering in service of a greater good. Your life is more difficult so that the lives of others might be better, safer, and more secure. There is a certain nobility to that. It's not always at the forefront of your mind, but it's there. That's how the system works. You give up certain freedoms in order to provide them to others. Well, that's exactly the point that Paul is making here. Christian, you are giving up certain things for the sake of the kingdom. Because you believe in its core principles, its core values, and you believe in the benefits that it provides. And so, although it is a sacrifice, you're also happy to serve. Well, maybe the military or the government isn't really your thing. Well, let's look at another example, see if we can connect. It's the athlete. It is 2024, and that means it is an election year, but also a year for the Olympics. Some of you will know that we get the Olympics from ancient Greece and Rome. 2,000 years ago, they were getting together to run track and field and challenge each other in wrestling. The marathon itself comes to us from ancient Greece. These are not new things. They were familiar to Paul and Timothy and other early Christians. They even had professional athletes who were kind of a big deal. In fact, they're who Paul is talking about here. The kind of athletes who signed up to compete at the biggest events like the Olympics or the Ithmian Games pledged themselves to a 10-month program of preparation, including prescribed exercises and a strict separated life and diet focused entirely on the goal of competition. If you violated the contract of that 10-month protocol, you were disqualified. You see, the thing is, sports have rules, and everyone has to play by them. You don't get to make your own and then declare yourself to be a champion. You accept the restrictions. You accept the standards. And then you seek to operate within them and excel. Ignore them or violate them, and there are consequences. Just a few weeks ago, the U.S. Olympic figure skating team learned that it would be receiving gold medals for their performance in the Beijing Winter Olympics in 2022 after a member of the Russian team was disqualified for drug use traced back to 2021 before those Olympics where she had won gold. With her disqualification, her team dropped points, meaning the U.S., which had taken silver two years ago, was now bumped up to gold. Notice this graphic produced by U.S. figure skating highlights the words integrity and excellence in that order. Yes, you need to perform well, that's the excellence, but in what I suspect is a slight dig at their opponents, you also need to play by the rules, that's the integrity. Here's where I fell down the rabbit hole for a minute, but learned a lot about disqualification in the Olympics. (laughs) Did you know that Olympic medals have been stripped away 157 times since 1949? 157 times. Men are slightly worse than women, losing their medals 85 times versus 72 for women. 
38 countries have been stripped of medals, but Russia is the king of them all, having been stripped of 60 medals. And if you put them back together with the former post-Soviet states from the Soviet Union, they've been stripped 97 times, or 67% of all infractions. In terms of events, track and field, also known as athletics, leads the list with 53, followed closely by weightlifting with 52, and then things drop off sharply. Wrestling has 13. Most sports have only one or two. Interestingly, they split fairly evenly with 54 gold, 50 silver, and 53 bronze. Okay, more than most of you wanted to know about athletes and competition, I'm sure. But for some of you, it does make a point that playing by the rules matters. And that's true spiritually as well. I'd also like to say that maybe this gives us some insight into understanding why we feel like we experience injustice at times. Like sometimes we come to church and we hear these songs and we're like, okay, I, I hear what they're singing or we read our Bible and we're like, okay, I see what that's saying. But what they're singing and what this is saying and what that pastor is sharing, like that just doesn't line up with my experience. Because if God is so great, if God is so big, if God is so righteous, if God is so wonderful, if he's got this powerful name and all this kind of stuff, then like why... Why are these bad things happening in my life? Why am I getting the short end of the stick? Why didn't I have the door opened for me that I was so sure was going to open? Like, I was doing the right thing the right way at the right time. Why didn't the right result come out? Anybody ever feel that? Yeah. And maybe the answer is that your gold medal is still two years away. For whatever reason that we don't fully understand, God is allowing justice to work out differently than we might have wanted it to work out. Maybe God's operating on a different timeline than the one that we would choose for ourselves. But justice is coming. No one ever truly gets away with anything. Like either Jesus has paid for it or you will but nothing goes unpaid. No debt goes unsettled. It just might be that your gold medal is two years away. And so what we have to figure out how to do, and I think it's a lifelong process, what we have to do is figure out how do we hold on to this truth that God is good and righteous and powerful and loving and kind and all of these things and yet, sometimes our gold medal is two years away. And what we have to figure out is how do we live in the, in the middle of that? Because we, we, we want the gold medal now, when I earned it, when I deserve it, because I did it the right way. Maybe I have to wait like two hours. Two days is a stretch. Two weeks, are you serious? Two, two years. Two years, God. Two years, you mean. Y'all, that's a big part of life. Figuring out how do you hold on to these two things. Moving on. I have a note in my Bible written next to this verse. It says, you're in training for reigning. You're in training for reigning. I don't know what pastor I heard say it, but it's catchy. And it's meant to encourage us to embrace the struggle of the Christian life, just like an athlete embraces competition. People kill themselves in the weight room or on the track, the field or the floor for the sake of a medal or a cup or in the ancient days, a wreath of laurel and flowers that was already dying and wilting by the time they got it home. And you can find champion after champion in every kind of sport that will tell you 
even if they played by the rules, even if they won fair and square, even if they set a new record, the thrill lasts for about five seconds. And then they need something else to chase. Friends, you can never win enough. You can never win enough. And if they put that much time and effort and energy and sacrifice into pursuing something that doesn't last and ultimately doesn't satisfy, why not spend your life mimicking their effort but pouring it into pursuing Christ and his kingdom? You see, don't miss the point here. It's not that the effort is wrong. It's not that the zeal and the commitment are wrong. It's what are you spending the effort on? Will it last? Okay. So maybe you're not into the military. You're not into athletics. I got one more chance to try and connect with you, and that's farming. <laughs> there is no such thing as a lazy, successful farmer. No such thing as a lazy, successful farmer. They have seasonal rhythms when there's more or less work than others, but it's typically just hard work. As John Stott said, successful farming depends as much on sweat as skill. The Apostle Paul thought this was a fitting model for the Christian life and ministry. He frequently commends doing hard things. He even says at least twice that he himself worked harder than other apostles, though not for his own glory, but for the sake of Christ. And he commends the hard work of others around him. I'll give you just four examples from one letter that he wrote. It's at the end of Romans, he includes all these little personal shout outs, right? And he says things like, Romans 16, verse 6, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Y'all know some people around this church that work hard for you. That's the kind of person that Paul would say, tell them I send my greetings. Just a couple verses more. Romans 16, verse 12. Greet Tryphenea and Trephosa who have worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis who has worked very hard in the Lord. That's where I always wonder, like, what does it feel like to be Tryphenea and Trephosa? It's like, yeah, we worked hard in the Lord. Persis worked very hard in the Lord. Man. <laughs> There are more examples in his other letters because it was a common thing for Paul to commend and encourage hard work. He understood that life is hard. And yet, here's the critical thing about the hard work of the farmer. It also requires patience. So you can't force the crops or the herd to grow. Botanical and biological growth just takes time. And so does spiritual growth. Listen to the way one commentator put it more than a hundred years ago. He wrote, often the farmer must be content first to work and then to wait. More than any other workman, he has to learn that there are no such things as quick results. The Christian, too, must learn to work and to wait. Often he must sow the good seed of the word into the hearts and minds of his hearers and see no immediate results. A teacher has often to teach and see no difference in those he teaches. A parent has often to seek to train and to guide and see no difference in the child. It is only when the years go by that the result is seen. For it often happens that when that same young person has grown into an adult, he or she is faced with some overmastering temptation or some terrible decision or some intolerable effort. And back into their mind comes some word of God or some flash of remembered teaching. And the teaching the guidance, the discipline bears fruit. 
and brings honor where without it there would have been dishonor. Salvation where without it there would have been ruin. The farmer has learned to wait with patience and so must the Christian teacher and the Christian parent. Church, farming the soil and the flocks is hard work. And so is the Christian life and ministry. Things take time. Results don't come overnight. Remember that when you want to see changes in yourself and remember that when you want to see changes in the people that you love. Okay. We have these three examples. The soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And they're each put forward as a model for Christians to consider as examples of how we should approach the Christian life. We've seen that there are particular things that we can learn from each. We can learn from the separation of the soldier. We can learn from the compliance of the athlete. And we can learn from the patience of the farmer. But now let me point out two things that all three have in common. Two things that all three have in common. And the first is they all have bad days. They all have bad days. They each have days when they don't feel like training or working, but it still has to be done. Christian, there will be days when the right thing is very hard to do. And there are days when the wrong thing is very easy and very, very attractive. We all have weak moments and tough seasons. We all experience the temptation to relax our standards or to pause our habits. Don't think you're doing it wrong just because your walk with God isn't full with overwhelming joy on any particular day. Today just might be the one when you need to grind it out because you remember the reward. Which is the other thing they all have in common. They all know there's a reward ahead. The soldier, the athlete, the farmer, they all know hard work pays off. If not with results, then at least with the benefit of the training and the work that you put in along the way. You're a better person for what you've been through and done, and likely others were blessed as you did what you did. Christian, life is oriented toward an outcome. Can you embrace restrictions today for the sake of an eternal reward? Can you embrace restrictions today for the sake of an eternal reward? Can you work hard and endure because of what you're convinced lies ahead? And maybe you say, yeah, but sometimes I have bad days. Well, I want to move on and talk about sources of strength and encouragement that will help us do all of this hard work in just a minute. But first, I want to say one more thing, and that's to point out what's happening here to the men and the young men who are among us. Because brothers, I need you to notice that here in Scripture, we find a call to a strenuous life, a noble life, a masculine life. That at times the church and religion can take on a softer, feminine style and feel. There is a soft side to Jesus. And we should thank our sisters for helping us to see it and sense it. But there is also a manly side. And it is on full display here. See, brothers, I want you to see that the Christian Bible is telling you to be strong. It's telling you to do hard things. And there's something in your chest that likes that, that wants that, because it's who God made you to be. It's what God made you to do. 
to sweat and to struggle and to serve like a soldier, like an athlete, like a hard-working farmer. And don't miss this because it's essential. Second Timothy is written to a pastor. So he's saying that this is what leadership in the Christian church should look like. Paul is saying this is the model. It's not an option. It's not an alternative. It's the standard. This is what it is supposed to be. The church, the family, the community, and the workplace need men who will show up, step up, lead, and lean in even when it's hard. Even when you're opposed. Even when all of the corporate messaging is telling you otherwise. Even when it feels like battle or opposition or the growth or the progress seems slow in coming, Scripture is so clear. It says that there is a spiritual enemy of your soul who wanders around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There are forces at work in this world and even a tendency inside our own chest at times to sit back, to pull back, or to drift away. And brothers, I'm asking you, resist that. Resist it. The world needs you. The church needs you. Other men need you. Your family needs you. And here's how you're going to survive. We said that life is hard. But if you suffer with others and for others, God's grace will get you through. If you suffer with others and for others, God's grace will get you through. Point number two, we suffer with others. Look with me at verse number three. I personally use the New King James translation of the Bible because it's just what I'm familiar with and comfortable with. But this is one area where I think other translations have it better. Because they say something like, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And if you have a New King James, you'll see that there's a footnote at the bottom of your page saying something similar. The original Greek word here is sin kakapatheo, which aside from being a fun word to say, starts with the prefix sin, S-Y-N, like synthesize or synergy. It means bringing two things together. So a more literal translation is join me in suffering. Or as other translations have it, share in suffering. Paul tells Timothy, I'm suffering too. It's hard for all of us. So let's encourage each other as we go. You're not alone, Timothy. And just because it's hard, that doesn't mean it's wrong. Church, one of the things that I love about this body of believers is walking around and seeing you ministering to each other watching dads huddle in the back hall on wednesday nights waiting to pick up their kids from youth group and they're ministering to each other now they might not think of it that way few of them would actually call it that but that's what it is They're encouraging each other by listening to each other, helping each other, caring about one another and what they're going through. And the women do the same thing. The teens do the same thing. I overheard one teen this week asking another to pray about a certain specific situation in their life. And then the other teen did right then, right there. Church, you are doing life together. You're caring for and about each other. You're suffering together, and you're doing it well. Just because life is hard doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. 
course, it's not just that we suffer with each other, but we also find fellowship with Jesus in our suffering. Notice that Paul tells Timothy here in verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The call to Christ is not a call to set your jaw, grit your teeth, and grind it out. It doesn't all ride on you. See, back in Paul's day, you had this group known as the Gnostics. They were a group of people who thought that you made your life better by discovering secret knowledge. Philosophy was a big thing among the Greeks and later the Romans, right? So some people thought, hey, the way you make your life better is you learn these particular secrets. That's what's going to change you. Then you had groups like the Stoics who said, no, no, no. You make your life better through self-mastery, through self-generated self-control. Both were ways of saying, it's on you to make your life better. Both of these approaches still exist today. And both of these approaches are wrong. Our lives are transformed when the grace of Jesus Christ comes rushing in. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not only are we saved by grace, we're also sustained by grace. God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul's response to that was, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yes, life is hard, but grace both gets you going and keeps you going as you find fellowship with Jesus and his people. So here's a question to ask yourself. How can I plug into God's grace as my source of sustaining power in light of the challenges I face today? How can I plug into God's grace as my source of sustaining power in light of the challenges I face today. Cordless is great for a drill, terrible for your walk with the Lord. How can you plug in? The power is there. Where's the connection? Because, point number three, we are called to suffer not just with others, but for others as well. We are called to suffer for others. Jesus suffered for us. That's what we commemorated and celebrated the past two Sundays, that Jesus Christ came to earth to save sinners. We all know that we have done wrong things in our lives. We know that God should punish us for that. But if we're willing, Jesus will take the punishment for us and give us his righteousness in exchange. That's what happened on the cross. He suffered in our place, and then he rose up from the dead, offering a new life to all who will trust in him. Well, Paul received that new life. Paul was utterly transformed by it, and so he thought little of suffering for and with Jesus while spreading the gospel, while mentoring Timothy, and while starting new churches. And now he's calling Timothy to suffer for others himself. Notice verse 4 is exhortation to share things that you receive from me with faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Jesus suffered. That impacted Paul. So Paul said, I'm willing to suffer. And that impacted Timothy. And now he's telling Timothy, hey, you should be willing to suffer too and let that impact others. Because we're all following in the footsteps and the model of Christ. Life is hard. There will be suffering. But we do it with others, including Jesus, and we do it 
for others because Jesus has done it for us. Every Christian has a ministry. You are serving Jesus somewhere. It might be in a small group or teaching in children's ministry or making dinner each night for people who don't say thank you. But someone is on the other side of you. Someone is on the receiving end of your life and ministry and attitude at home, at work, or in the church. You are suffering for them just like Jesus and others suffer for you. Again, life is hard for all of us. You are not the only one. And just because it's hard doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. We are called to push through, grounded in grace, drawing strength from the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill the ministry and the role that Jesus has entrusted to us. And then other people will benefit from that. The day is coming when you will stand before God. And hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So don't go down cowering when life gets hard. Don't give up or give in. Don't moan too much about the culture. It was against Timothy too. Receive the grace of Jesus. Receive the encouragement of the saints that you are suffering with and pour into others. Pass on the faith. One last thing. Here in verse 7. Consider what I'm saying. May the Lord give you understanding. Church, sometimes you need to think on things. You need to chew on them. You need to pray on them. It's often easier to get an answer from Google than it is from God. But is it the right answer? You may say, you know, I've tried reading my Bible and I just don't understand it. Or I I hear what it's saying or I hear what you're saying, Pastor, and and I just don't know exactly what to do. Okay. Have you asked for help? First from the Lord and and then from others. Because the Apostle Paul is writing to the pastor of a church. And his expectation is that that pastor might need to spend some time thinking about what he's reading and what he's hearing and what that means. And that that pastor might need for the Lord to give some understanding. Well, if that's true of the Apostle Paul and Pastor Timothy, how much more so should that be true of any of us? Friends, sometimes we need to consider what it is that Scripture is saying. We need to consider what it is that God's trying to speak to us and ask the Lord to give us understanding. If God is getting your attention then give him time to speak and to guide you. Don't expect an immediate answer. Don't expect immediate clarity and understanding. Sometimes God wants to sit in the struggle with us for a little while. So pray, chew on things, go for a walk, take a shower, talk with a friend, do whatever it is that you need to do, but seek understanding from the Lord. He is trying to lead you through an otherwise difficult life by encouraging you to suffer with and for others, anchored in and strengthened by the grace of Christ. But you may have to spend some time considering these things. The answers might not always be immediate and obvious. And that's okay. We're going to celebrate the suffering of Jesus this morning by receiving communion. It's a good time to you to remember all that he has done and recommit yourself to following and serving him even when it's hard. It's a good time to ask him to make you strong in his grace so that you can walk the path that he's laying before you and walk it well for his glory 
and the good of others. It's a good time to consider what Scripture is saying and receive understanding from the Lord. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and want to give you praise. But some of us are also held back by the difficulties in our lives, by the things that we've been praying for for a while and just haven't seen the change. And God, we need the admonishment that we've heard this morning to think of ourselves as a soldier, to think of ourselves as an athlete, to think of ourselves as a hardworking farmer because we're going through some difficulties, Lord, and it's been a while. Some of us feel like those Olympians. Like we put in a work request two years ago, Lord, and just haven't gotten a call back yet, so just kind of wanting to bump that up the chain again. Father, would you please minister to us in the way that we need to receive? Give us the strength in the grace of Jesus that we need to endure the weight between what we want to see and what we're currently living. Father, help us to be patient as you bring your will to pass, as you work toward the culmination of your kingdom. God, may we be found faithful. Even on our bad days, would you meet us with the grace that we need to get through the day? God, help us not to focus so much on today that we lose sight of a 20-year career of service or an entire career of competition. May we not be discouraged by one low qualification or one poor result in competition, but may we look back on an entire career of contribution. May we not be discouraged by one day of wilting flowers in the garden, but may we be encouraged by seeing what you've been doing and developing in the fields that we've been working over the long haul. God, would you please carry us through the difficult days and give us the strength that we need to continue pressing on, anchored in grace, willing to suffer for others because Christ has suffered for us, willing to suffer with others because others are suffering and Christ is carrying us through. God, would you please make us into the men and women that you want us to be for your glory and the good of others, even when life is hard. We ask it now in the name of your Son, our Savior, Christ the King. Amen. Why don't you take just a minute while the um, team plays some music here, do business with the Lord individually, come on forward, grab the elements for communion, take them back to your seats, and we'll partake together in just a moment.
So there's kind of a cool intersection between this passage of Scripture and receiving communion. Um, And that is that communion represents a meal, right, that would be significant to each of the three examples that we just saw this morning. An army moves on its stomach. And it's been said that amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics, because you got to be concerned about the rations of your army. Regardless of what empire they serve or what nation they serve, this is just one of the complexities of military operations throughout history is great. You're going to go fight. You're going to move them. What are they going to eat? Today we have MREs, a little packaged bag with what somebody said was nutritious all like thrown in there for you. Church, God is calling you to see yourself as a soldier. And he's giving you the rations that you need for your service. Food is also important to any elite level athlete. Those that are competing or seeking to prepare themselves for competition at the highest levels will often have very strict diets. And even today, it's not uncommon for competitive athletes to have a nutritionist that's assigned to them, dialing in their macros and paying a lot of attention to what they're eating and how that food is going to affect their performance. Some of you happen to know a little bit of Madeline and I's story, right, and how uh, it kind of began. There's a little bit of a prequel, but a a lot of it began when I moved back to California and the first Sunday there went to church and met up with some old friends. And after church, we all went out for lunch and we went to a place called Steve's Burger and sitting not directly across from me, but kind of catty corner across from me was this good looking brunette who took her then curly hair and shoved it back into the collar of her shirt and with two hands picked up a guacamole bacon cheeseburger and started just reveling in it. (laughs) Because she had been in strict training for weeks and months leading up to that, seeking to try out for the former national championship women's soccer team and, and made their roster but she had been eating lean chicken breasts and salads for a while in order to discipline herself for the sake of performance. And now she was celebrating (laughs) with something that was indulgent. Church, God is calling you to see yourself as an athlete. And he's saying, here's the meal that's going to help you optimize your performance. And this meal reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus taken from a a grape that was crushed. There's all kinds of theological significance in that, right? But that grape came from a vine that was tended by a hardworking farmer. And this bread represents his body that was broken. And it's made out of wheat that has been crushed and that wheat came from ground that was tended by a hard-working farmer so you hold in your hands this morning reminders of all the things that the lord is trying to communicate to you today and i just hope that as you receive them you would understand that you're also receiving what it is that god wants to give you to do the things that he's calling you to do Why don't you stand with me as we receive the elements today? Father, we do thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the rations that you're giving to us as soldiers. We thank you for the diet that you're giving us to optimize our performance as athletes. We thank you for the reminders that you're giving us of what comes from the land when a hardworking farmer does his or her job well. May we be found doing well in your service because we receive the empowering of grace through the broken body and the shed blood, again, of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. It's a blessing to be with you all. May you walk anchored in the grace of God today. We're going to close with a song of worship to the God who's done all these great things for us. And when we're done, we have the First Steps Luncheon, if you're here and signed up for that. You might also want to compete as an athlete. If you missed the announcement earlier, the church has a softball team. They're the reigning champions for the conference, and they're getting ready to start up the new season. AJ's got on the bright orange jersey back here, and (laughs) Sam is also walking around wearing one. You can stop by the welcome table or stop either of these men, and they can tell you more. The softball team's open to co-ed? It is. It is, yeah. So co-ed, men and women, all ages. Um, So you can talk to, again, AJ or uh, Sam is walking around wearing a jersey as well. You can talk to them, find out more about that. You can compete as an athlete, according to the rules, especially with the City Gates Church, like, written on your chest, Okay. (laughs) Um, And then also, after the service, we've got the men's moment coming up, and there's going to be more information about that five-mile hike that's coming up that you men can bring your your kids out on as well. So plenty of opportunities to put practice to the things that we've seen in Scripture today. All right? God bless. I love you. Let's sing. in strength or might, but in the grace of God, I glory in weakness to live is Christ in plenty or in want, that I may know that all may see his power within me. All my boast is in Jesus. I cannot
church. Good to be together with you this morning. Have a great day. We'll see you again next Sunday for worship. Quiet. We shout out your praise. 